Hello, 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 everyone. Good morning and welcome to episode 29 of Survivor Strong, the podcast for survivors of childhood trauma. So guys, I am super excited about the show today because we get to talk to managing partner and therapist Kara Mumford from the Trauma Therapy co uh, Company. Uh, Kara is here to answer all our questions pertaining to therapy. Hi, Kara. Welcome to Survivor Strong. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yes, I'm so happy to have you here. So to start, can you just um, tell us a little bit about yourself and the Trauma Therapy Company? Yeah, so I am a licensed independent social work supervisor. So I have a bachelor's in psychology and child development and a master's in social work. And I am the owner, clinical director, supervisor here at the Trauma Therapy Company. Um, I'm a mom first and a trauma survivor. So um, mm -hmm. I started the company because um, the treatment that myself and my coworkers were experiencing in our community mental health positions were so much like the experiences we've had growing up that it was very much um, re-traumatizing. We were all kind of in fight or flight right along with our clients. So mm. at this place kind of came out of wanting a safe space for myself and my providers. Um, and this is my office. So we're a lot different. You can see my like uh, wall over here and <laughs> yeah. our couches. And we're very much like a uh, living room set up. So uh, very anti-doctor's office -y. Yeah, I can see that. It looks very comfortable, welcoming, inviting, which are all you know, positives, as you know, you, you can go in some of the stuffiest offices and it's, you know, it, it does like, you're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah, it's just too much. <clears throat> well, that's awesome. Um, so why do you think therapy is so important in general? That's a really great question. So I think it's important to work on you and work on the things that you've survived in your past, because if we don't work on them, then we're going to repeat them. So if we don't start to heal those wounds within ourselves, then we're going to bleed on people that didn't hurt us. So we need to be able to, to move forward. What happened to us in the past was not our fault, but what we do and how we take control of our life moving forward is in our power. So it's, I feel like therapy is one of the many ways to take your power back. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Um, and at the end of the day, that's really the bottom line for me. What I found for therapy is finding the tools to take my power back from all of this trauma that had been dumped on me, trauma that I didn't ask for, um, that caused distorted thoughts and these triggers and, um, you know, uh, boundaries, you know, people violating my boundaries all the time. Um, and I'm learning after eight years of my own intense, you know, psychotherapy <laughs> that it's about taking your power back and saying, you know what? No, I don't want to be treated that way. I'm not going to allow anyone to treat me that way because you don't realize how much your childhood trauma bleeds into your present if you don't heal from it. You know, a lot of people make excuses, you know, for, oh, I'm just angry. This is just how I, this is just how I am. I'm, I'm always high strung. I've always been this way. I've always been kind of erratic. Well, really have you always been that way or did you s become that way because of something that happened to you? So I, I couldn't agree more. It's about taking your power back. And I know that there are like so many different forms of therapy. For instance, I mean, I go to a psychotherapy. I'm sorry, <clears throat> a psychotherapist have been twice a week for eight years now. Um, and what I understand the difference between say, um, talk psychology and psychotherapy is psychology is basically you just go in and you, you talk to the person, you kind of, you're able to vent, get off kind of like what's happening now in the present, you know, in, um, you know, stressful work environments. And psychotherapy is actually digging into your, your traumas and not only talking about your traumas, but talking about why you felt that way about, you know, when the trauma was happening, why you felt 
feel the way that you do after the trauma and everything in between. Um, so what other forms of therapy are out there and what are some of the differences that you can, you know, provide for people who may not know? So at the Trauma Therapy Company, we really hope to provide a lot of different therapies. Um, we, we hope to be the kind of like um, like the hub in Ohio and once they allow us to treat other states across the U.S. But right now, um, most of us are trained in EMDR or scheduled to get trained in EMDR because mm. it is one of the therapies that really does dig deep, work on the past, not blame you for how you're experiencing it or how you're recreating it or how you survived. Um, so it doesn't base off the medical model. It's what happened to you. And how can we work through that and come out the other side? Um, but there is also like couples therapy. We have a couples therapist that helps with um, working through the trauma in your relationship and helping mm -hmm. you to understand each other. There's also like intimacy or like sex therapy that can help you with those struggles with intimacy because of your past trauma or people who may have hurt you in the past. We have a grief therapist. Um, I also do animal assisted therapy. So I have two therapy oh. dogs that come in and um, I don't have them with me today because they definitely need a bath and I haven't been <laughs> able to do that. But uh, they, you know, just provide that affection that really we're not allowed to do. Mm. Um, like I'm not allowed to like, I'm not really allowed to like hug my clients unless it's really beneficial for them. But my dog will, they definitely will accept a hug and, you know, lay on their lap and while well, we're talking about the tough stuff and really provide that like deep pressure therapy. There is a lot of mindfulness therapy that we incorporate. Uh, another one that we really like and help clients with is called DBT. It's dialectical behavioral therapy. Hmm. And it talks about those skills and like distress tolerance, um, how to handle everything that's coming up. So some people really enjoy the mindfulness and meditation, and that's a part of DBT. But sometimes we need some real concrete skills that mm -hmm. um, with acronyms that are easy to remember and practice using them. So there are DBT programs that allow you to do group, individual, and that ongoing support that you need to implement those skills. So it's great what we can learn in therapy, but how do I use it? Mm, that's beautiful. So you offer, my next question was going to be, you know, what type of therapy therapies do you offer? And gosh, you, <laughs> you cover everything. And that's really a, a, an important thing because all of those aspects of our lives are affected by trauma, right? And you have to do more than just focus on yourself. You know, it affects relationships. And so that's really beautiful. Can you tell people um, who may not know, you know, what is mindfulness and how does that help when you're, you know, after, after you've been traumatized, how could mindfulness help? What is it and how could it help? So mindfulness really works on like the brain body connection. So our brain is an organ just like our heart and we do not want our heart to stop working, right? But we're right. always asking brain to stop just give me a break just slow down just stop and mindfulness is teaching you to just do that a lot of people think that mindfulness is just meditating and they have in their mind this image of like the perfect meditator that's like calm and relaxed and their face is all relaxed and they're just serene I don't look like that when I meditate. I assure you, I have the number 11s and I'm thinking really, really hard. And mindfulness is paying attention like your life depended on it. And it doesn't have to be just sitting there. The way we do mindfulness is walking someone through a mindful story. So not just dropping them into a place that's supposed to be calm and relaxing, that they're supposed to make up in their mind. The way I do it and the way I teach my providers is more of like a mental walking meditation. So you're driving up to this place that you remember being at or that you can imagine going to and you get out of the car and you lock the car and you take your shoes off and you toss them in the trunk and you you walk slowly towards this place. You know, you do one thing after a time, like to keep your brain on a path because our brains don't naturally do that with trauma. Your brain is trying to save your life. 
be aware of that trigger, be aware of that danger, be aware of that danger, prevent that from happening again. You can mindfully wash the dishes. I hate washing the dishes. So that's one that I do every day. Wash it one dish at a time, dry one dish at a time, put the dish away. Driving the car. I attempt to mindfully drive the car everywhere I go because my brain likes to disassociate. I get in the car and I get where I'm going and sometimes it's not where I meant to go. You know, right. so that disassociation happens a lot with the trauma brain because checking out was how we survived. I don't yes. want to record what is happening because this is terrible and I don't want to remember it. So yes. we teach our brain to kind of meditate in an unhealthy way. We teach our brain to shut down, flatten, and we want our brain to be active and paying attention to what we choose. So even driving the car, my kids and I play a game where we try to find cars that are missing a headlight. And um, where I grew up, it's called Padiddle, but um, <laughs> you say Padiddle and you get a point or you tap the ceiling. So it's kind of a mindful way of paying attention to your environment. I have someone that I've worked with that said, I try to look for animals, dogs, cats, birds, mm -hmm. and they just, that's their way of mindfully driving. So you mm -hmm. can do anything mindfully as long as you're paying attention, like your life depended on it. You're working that muscle that's right in the mm -hmm. middle of your brain that controls what you feel and what you think. And we're trying, we're, we're putting it together. Wow. And so for those who may not know, you mentioned dissociating. Um, can you just explain that just a little bit for, for, the, for the listeners who may not know what that is? Disassociating can mean something different to every brain, but it's like daydreaming and checking out and going somewhere else in your mind and you're not really here. If you've ever... Um, we're, we're scrolling on, on, you know, social media and hours have gone by. You didn't really take in every single thing that you saw. You were kind of like off somewhere. If you're, you know, Netflix binging or, you know, streaming binging or um, just kind of staring off in space, that's something that I do um, or that I have to ha have been working on with my trauma is that I tend to just stare off in space. And it's more common for children who are left by themselves a lot or left to entertain themselves. We just kind of go off and, you know, check out in our brain um, driving and you get in the car and you're thinking about what's going on for the day and then you end up at work. You didn't mm -hmm. really attend to drive and it's very dangerous. You know, we, we tend to scroll on social media as a way to calm down at the end of the day but we're not actually calm. It's kind of like mm. putting your brain in neutral and just coasting. You didn't really yeah. calm down, mm -hmm. you know, and that time just gets away. And if we look at the time that we spend on our screens, that's the most common disassociation I see is just scrolling, oh, um, watching yeah. TV and just checking out or in the mid conversation. And you're just like, wait, I forgot to listen. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. And people don't realize that, you know, spending hours and hours on a video game, that's, you know, you're not really paying attention to anything else around you. You're like, even, and that's how I disassociate a lot of times is on video games. And, and once I get there, it's like hours and um, my husband will tell you, <laughs> it's like, okay, you know, he has to call my name several times to get me out of it. So it's those kind of, you know, mundane things that you think that you're just, oh, I'm just sitting here watching TV. But, you know, if you think about it, do you remember every show that you watch? Do you remember every detail? <laughs> you know, if not, then you probably really weren't there, there watching the TV. Um, so, what type of therapy do you specialize in specifically? So I specialize in EMDR because it, when I did my training as a, as a social worker, I realized through my own therapy that I made an entire career out of taking care of other people. And EMDR is one of those therapies where you focus on what happened to them. And instead of being like an eclectic therapist where I use a lot of different skills in kind of a hodgepodge way, I got certified in EMDR. I consult with other therapists who are certified and I've been working towards my consultant license so that I can consult with other therapists to stay true to the therapy because EMDR is so effective. And I'm not sure of the exact numbers because I'm not really a numbers kind of person. Mm -hmm. 
But when I originally was seeking out what therapy do I want to get trained in, there was some research saying that like just talk therapy, just supportive therapy is helpful because of the relationship with the provider. If you have a good relationship with the provider, just that is about 30% effective. So you can help them around 30%. But EMDR research has been seen to be like 60 to 80 percent effective in just six to eight sessions, depending on how much trauma, how hard we work. And we do it in a relationship way. So we don't do six sessions of straight working on memories. But EMDR is a comprehensive therapy. So we do like a dance between working on memories, doing some deeper work stabilizing, reviewing coping skills, talking and learning about their family and learning about their life and what is your day to day like. And so I try to build that relationship and capitalize on the effectiveness of having a good relationship with my clients. And then that effectiveness of of EMDR being being mindful of what the the core of EMDR is, the foundation, the research, Mm. and really just focusing on stabilizing the client and working on the past and working on trying to be stable and working on the past. So Mm -hmm. that is what Mm -hmm. I am trying to be very, very faithful to is the model of EMDR therapy. And then my dogs are there just as an additional support. So we don't really, I don't really use animal therapy as a focus like we do with like horse therapy or equine therapy, Mm -hmm. where the horse is kind of the modality that you focus on. My dogs are just as supportive, you know? Wow. So what is EMDR therapy for those who may not know? And you may have already answered this. And, you know, how does it help survivors of trauma? Like, what does EMDR stand for? Um, You know, what are the techniques, different techniques that you might use? So EMDR therapy is eye movement. So your eyes going back and forth desensitization so lowering the intensity of the trigger and reprocessing so you use that back and forth motion like we have with REM sleep and we use that to help us bring a memory that's stored incorrectly it's stored in the emotional brain the lower parts of our brain and we move it up to the human brain the higher functioning brain where the long-term storage kind of is so that like it's not something that is currently happening to you it is something that's crappy that happened a long time ago so we can't make memories less, I use another word in therapy, but less crappy. Um, (laughs) But we can bring down the charge, turn the lights off of it, uh, take the picture and make it fuzzy, make it blurry, make it smaller, make it further away so that it's something that happened a long time ago to you and you don't feel that small, that little, that childlike when it is triggered. So EMDR works on a brain body level and we can look at the brain research that it shows that people who have trauma, that their brain, the structure of their brain changes. The amygdala, the emergency alarm gets bigger, the gray matter and the white matter, the it shifts. And I'm not good with the parts of the brain. That's why I had it tattooed on my arm because I can't remember those specific words and stuff. (laughs) What matters to me is how it works in your brain. Your concentration, your focus is all harder because your brain is trying to attend to all these triggers as if like a lion had jumped in the room and your brain honestly thinks that it's going to happen any moment. So how can you focus on building relationships when a lion is about to jump through the room, you know? Mm -hmm. So EMDR turns down that emergency alarm and helps you to move forward and it talk it's based on you know the the faulty brain wiring the old like 
archaic way that our brain is formed and takes for me it takes the stigmatization away from being a trauma survivor and it's just like someone who has a faulty pancreas or a faulty heart or a faulty liver you know we have a faulty brain that is wired for survival and not wired for love and affection and and relationships so Mm. if you feel like you're you're just surviving the day you probably are because that's how you grew up. And we can see that people after EMDR therapy, their brain structure genuinely changes and looks much more like somebody pre-trauma than somebody in the middle of the trauma. That's fascinating. I've never tried that type of therapy before. I have to tell you, that's one thing that I've never tried. Um, It's interesting. I wonder, you know, I have to talk to my therapist about that and see if that's something that, that I should do in addition to the therapies that I'm doing twice a week because, you know, anything that could help improve, I'm all for that, you know, and you, and you brought up triggers, which is a really good conversation to have because, you know, not a lot of people understand exactly what triggers are and how I describe it is trigger. You don't know when you're going to be triggered. And a lot of times you don't know what's going to trigger you, when it's going to trigger you, how it's going to trigger you. For me, and most people, when they hear this, they're surprised. I can be triggered by a car, a certain type of car that I see. I could be triggered by a certain scent that I smell walking in, you know, the grocery store. If someone passes by me and happens to wear a particular cologne, I can be triggered by certain songs. Um, Movies trigger me. Some movies trigger me. Um, And so, obviously, once you know when you're triggered... Um, you know what triggered you, right? But you don't always know what is going to trigger you. And I wanted you to talk about that a little bit more and maybe help people be a little bit more compassionate with themselves when it comes to being triggered and, and you know, helping them understand that it's not their fault that they got triggered, that they can't help it, <laughs> you know, if, if they get triggered. Um, and I, you know, so I just wanted to see if you could, you know, add anything to that thought that, you know, might be helpful. That is a great point to put at, point out. And the way I explain it is I use very like real world experiences that a lot of my clients can relate to. And since I live in more of an inner city, the explanation that I give to a lot of clients is like you're driving down the road and a cop car pulls out behind you. And we won't get into the political aspect of all of that. But what do you <laughs> feel? That cop pulled out right behind your car right after you pass. Your body lights up like a Christmas tree. You're not speeding, but you don't remember that. Your body lights up. You immediately think all these things, these past experiences, all the things that you've heard, witnessed, um, read about that's maybe going on, and the worst of the worst comes up. And then they turn off. And you're still feeling that your heart rate is up, your breathing is fast, you're maybe starting to sweat. I get really warm, my ears start getting red, I can't think about anything. Now I'm probably mm-hmm. swerving, now I'm probably going slow, now I'm brake checking, right? And it takes you probably the whole way home for your breathing to start settling, your body to start calming down, and you go, I wasn't speeding. My license is valid. I have insurance. There, there is no reason. If he wanted to pull me over, now you're thinking all the things you could have possibly said. But you can't ever control that. We, unfortunately, we need we we need police officers. We want them to pull people over who are driving unsafely. We don't want them to pull us over, right? So we're never going to be able to avoid that situation. But handling yourself so that you don't get pulled over because you were triggered, you know, that's why it's important to work on those triggers. It, it doesn't matter what therapy you so choose to do. There are many great therapies that help you with those triggers and working through them. And they do it in all all about a different way. For me, I got trained in EMDR because, let's say for like cognitive behavioral therapy, they would help you to challenge that thought, but you are safe right now, but you are not speeding, but you have not been pulled over and help you remember those things. I don't remember them, you know? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I have a hard time rationalizing that when my brain is just going to argue right back 
but people are pulled over all the time for no reason. You know, Mm -hmm. what if, what if my tail light is out and then my anxiety makes me say silly things that don't make any sense. And, you know, Mm -hmm. and all of those Mm -hmm. things that I could or would possibly do wrong and the probability of that and the research of that and the news. And so that is not one that I felt like would be really great for me as a client. And Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I could authentically help clients in that manner because Mm -hmm. it just doesn't personally for me as a complex trauma survivor that just wasn't a good one a good fit for me personally so mm-hmm. that is why I chose EMDR and desensitizing or bringing down a trigger using EMDR it doesn't feel simple but really we just add those slow back and forths to the trigger and your brain helps bring it down there's a lot more complex mm-hmm. explanation for why it works um, but we yeah. can bring <laughs> sure. down the trigger and we can bring down the past memories that caused that to happen. Right. And I just want to say this too, and I want to make this very clear for everybody who's watching and listening. So when it comes to triggers, um, you know, it's true that nobody can make you feel any particular way, right? Nobody can make you feel a certain way. But what I say about triggers is if someone is constantly you know, stepping on your toe (laughs) and they're constantly doing things that they know is upsetting to you or they know, you know, gets you going, they are triggering you and they can't say, well, I can't trigger you, da, 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 da. No, their behavior is triggering. Um, And so I want to make that clear too, by the way, you know, nobody can make you feel a certain way unless they continue to do things over and over and over that they know it's harmful to you. So if there's anyone in your life that does that, um, I hope you speak up and you're able to say to them, hey, um, I don't like when you do that. I'm triggered and I need you to to take this seriously. This is important. And, you know, and just be kind to yourself. Be compassionate with yourself above all because you don't have control over your triggers. You don't know how you're going to react. You can't predict it. Once it happens, you're in it. And when you're in it, you can't necessarily pull yourself right out of it. And that's common, you know, so just be kind and compassionate with yourself when it comes to that, because trust me, everybody who is triggered understands. And I just hope that you have the understanding for yourself. So, you know, we talked about a lot of different therapies and, you know, someone actually asked me this question and I didn't know how to answer it. So I'm really curious how you're going to answer it. They're like... So what is therapy? When I get this question, I say, well, there's a lot of different types of therapy, but you know, what is therapy in general? Is it to help you process past emotion? Is it to help you um, regulate your current emotion? You know, what, what is therapy? That is a great question. And the way I describe it to people, um, because I've been told in in the past that as a therapist, I can't say to someone, oh, you need therapy. That doesn't come across really well. And the stigma that surrounds therapy is still alive Mm -hmm. and well. Oh, yes. The way I say therapy is support. And what support means to you and where you are in your trauma healing journey may require a variety of different support. So Mm -hmm. dog training for me and training my service and therapy dog has been the best therapy I could ever do because I had to be aware of my triggers and Mm -hmm. what I needed when I'm triggered. And then I had to train them to respond, to sense, smell, be aware of my trigger and act. And I had to put myself in those positions to need that help. And to train them to do those things. And Mm -hmm. that was a very big therapy to me. Finding a therapist, a professional person who's trained in the things that I feel strongly about and has a personal experience was very important to me. So I've been in therapy for over a decade and it helps me to be a better mom, a better therapist, 
And at times I've needed different types of therapy. And um, I'm sure my therapist could tell, you know, could tell a whole world of things if she were allowed. But I would say, oh, I need someone to hold me accountable. I need someone to call me on my stuff. And she says, you do that well enough. You are hard enough on yourself. No, you don't need help with that. You need somebody to say you're allowed to make mistakes. Mm. So sometimes even the things that we think we need is not what we need at that point in our journey. Sometimes therapy is medications. Everybody has a different belief and I never try to say what is, what someone should or shouldn't do when it comes to medications, mm -hmm. but there has been times in my life that I was not able to engage in my other support systems without the help of medication. I needed that breathing room. So sometimes therapy is medications. Sometimes therapy is physical exercise. Sometimes sometimes therapy is a, a new lipstick and a mm -hmm, and a chat with your mm -hmm. best friend, you know? It's not always professional help, you know? And we need a different thing. So therapy is really support. I really love and that that's perfect. And I'm so glad that, that you answered that because now I have an answer. <laughs> if I get that question again, it's therapy is basically is support. It's support for whatever you need in whatever you're going through, essentially. Um, and this is a yep. And some people hear when someone says like you need therapy, they hear it like that. Right. You need therapy as right. a And you know the thing is with therapy, I thousand percent believe that everybody should have a therapist because therapy isn't just for people who have past trauma. Therapy is for everybody. Just imagine this. You have one person that you can go to. You can tell them every secret, no deep, dark pain that's ever happened to you, every embarrassing thing that you could have ever possibly done that you feel like Unless you talk about it and get it out, it's just going to haunt you. And you have this one person who, A, is always going to look at situations from your best interest, if they're the right therapist for you. You have a confidential source who is going to not judge you in anything that you've done. And that's something that I want people to hear. Therapists are not judgmental. It, you know, it's all about just getting to know you, your trauma, and what it is that you need to work on. Yeah, I mean, there are just so many, so many benefits to it that do it. And actually, we have a question, and it's on the list, but it's funny. So, so obviously, people were wondering this. <laughs> um, so why do we have to talk about the same traumas multiple times? Why can't we just go into the therapist office and say, okay, this happened to me when I was 12. I didn't like it. It was wrong. It was bad. Okay, I told you my trauma now. Next, move on. <laughs> that is a Can great you explain? question. And, yeah. Um, so I'll first say that in EMDR, we don't have to process a memory more than once. So I'll first say that not every therapy do you have to repeat it over and over again. But if you were telling me about breakfast this morning and you told me one time, that would feel enough validation, right? Mm -hmm. You made a great breakfast, it was healthy, it, you woke up early and you were ready, you had it planned out, you had all the groceries, you got your caffeine, you were proud of yourself and you told somebody one time, I am proud of myself and they gave you a positive response, that was enough support to feel supported. Mm. Trauma is not like that, it's not stored in that part of the brain. It's in the lower part of the brain. So based on right my training and what the therapy that I do, the reason I say that just verbalizing it is not enough is because they're not stored in the same part of the brain. Mm. Verbal language is up here mm -hmm. in our frontal lobe. Mm -hmm. And the trauma is stored in the lower parts of our brain, the emotional brain. And we know that because we feel it words are not enough. And that's why I don't do some of the other therapies that yes, they do work. Mm -hmm. I don't do let's say narrative therapy. First of all, because my trauma bucket is already full. And I have mm -hmm. a very visual memory. So yes. as a client would be verbalizing their trauma over and over and over and over again until they don't light up like a Christmas tree. I am never gonna forget that. 
Mm. partially because I genuinely care about my clients and I am right there beside them and I am with them and I am going through the dark tunnel with them. I'm not going to forget the way their face scrunched and the, the tears and the way their mm. breathing caught. And I am going to remember those things because I'm present with the client. So the reason I don't do the therapies that require somebody to go over it and over it and over it is because I'm a very empathetic person and mm. that hurts me nowhere near as much as I can see it's hurting the client and hurting the sure. human in survivor yeah. in front of me. And the reason that we maybe have to go over it multiple times is because words just are not enough. It's not stored that way. Right. And also for me, um, you know, I do go over the same things over and over. And for me, it's helpful because I am, well, I had been just overwhelmed with emotion and I didn't know what that feeling was. You know, I didn't know how I was feeling, why I was feeling that way. And I didn't understand why I could, you know, be in tears and tell a whole story. And then, you know, maybe a month later, think about something else within the same trauma that would cause different tears. And then that's when I realized, wait a second, it, not only is it, the trauma is stored in our bodies too, as you know, you know, um, which is probably why you feel it so intensely. Not only are you an empath, but you also have that your own trauma stored in your body that just is going to make you feel uncomfortable. But I had so many different emotions and, it, you know, I was sad. I was sad about, you know, parental betrayal, but then I was angry. And, you know, it, it's almost like the grieving process when you're, when you're going through all the, you know, um, when you're working on, on traumatic things, you know, you have denial, you know, g g anger, all of those. I can't remember all of them at the top of my head right now, but you get my point. And so for me, it was important to talk about, no, this is why I was angry when that happened. And this is why I was sad when that happened. So for some people that works, but like you said, that doesn't work for everyone. And I'm really happy to hear that there is an option out there for people who don't want to do that, who want who want to maybe try EMDR and just you know go through a memory once and see if that's what they need I, I'm so glad because I wasn't aware of that and you see how we learn things <laughs> we learn something new every day it's really it's really true um and I'm aware and, of my personal biases because I'm trained in EMDR I am 100% going to be biased to EMDR and I yes. try <laughs> to mind my own business and be aware of the landmines but like even though you clearly had a particular memory that you were thinking about that you received those benefits of going over it over and over again mm -hmm. and but when you watch this back back and you replay this you're going to see that your eyes were going back and forth so your eye your brain was pulling it back up you know, so it's in there and your brain is already trying to diagnose, like to digest it. Mm -hmm. And you can see it because you're, I don't know if, um, if your, your fans that are watching can see you on video, but your eyes go back and forth when you talk about a trauma. And there are other therapies, the uh, brain spotting is one of them that is very interesting, but I'm not trained in. And it works with where it's stored in the brain, you know? Oh. So you can still talk about it. I still talk about the traumas that I've already worked on and how that helps me. And especially now that they're accessible. Like even today I was working with a, with a client who has lost a parent and I was able to verbalize my loss of my father without mm. being lit up like a Christmas tree. So now I'm able to use that experience to help other people. You know, mm -hmm. so the memory mm -hmm. doesn't become inaccessible that we can't verbalize it. But when you're in the moment and going through it with EMDR, you're going through like uh, almost like the waves of the ocean. You get all those feelings yeah. so fast. Yeah. It's like fast forwarding the bad parts, you know. Wow. 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 And at the end of the day, this processing, this emotional processing, you know, processing of all of these past emotions, you know, 
I mean, and I know there's probably, you know, a five page list long of, of ways that it, it benefits the clients, but you know, what are some of the top benefits for processing emotion from the past? Why is it so helpful? You had said, you had said with the triggers, like we don't get to decide when they come up and when they um, e explode on the inside and it could be, um, at the worst moment and I am not afraid to embarrass myself and talk about my own personal experience because I never want to talk about a, a survivor that is not my story to tell um, mm -hmm. but for mm -hmm. me I was taking my licensing exam for social work and they have to pat you down and my brain just exploded and I say very inappropriate things when my I got word vomit and just things just come out um and I then I embarrassed the poor guy who's just trying to do his job um and now he'll never forget that and I'll never forget that now I gotta work through that therapy too or that in therapy too so now we are re-traumatizing ourselves mm. you know because we were triggered and then you're more vulnerable to being re-traumatized or taken advantage of because mm. let's say we shut down or we um it's called fawning or flattening out you're a peacekeeper and you try to mm -hmm. not like yep. cause somebody else to explode and then we can't speak up and say no i don't want this to happen don't touch me there don't say that don't do that so right. then we're more likely to be re-traumatized. So one of the biggest things is that we want to work on the past so that we don't repeat it. Right. So so basically the benefit is to stop repeating past behaviors, to break cycles. Um, yeah, that I mean, that's a beautiful way to put it because that's essentially what it is. It's, it's We want to stop re-traumatizing ourselves, stop putting ourselves in situations where um, we're uncomfortable or we hurt ourselves or, um, you know, causing self-sabotage or whatever. Um, so do you think that therapy works for everyone? Do you think that, I, that you know, the, the broad statement that, you know, therapy works for everyone? Do you think that's true? I think there is, that is the beginning of a much more detailed example. So therapy works for everyone when it's the right therapist. Mm -hmm. It's the right time. It's the mm -hmm. right kind of therapy. So I tell people that therapy is like a pair of jeans. And if it doesn't fit right, we all know where we put those jeans that are not a good fit. Mm -hmm. And therapy should not be in the bottom drawer of your dresser or in the back of your closet. So it, whether it's your best friend who was there with you all along the way and knew your you, knew your uh, your perpetrator or was there with you or a clergy person or um, your your Reiki provider, it doesn't have to be your therapist or a licensed right, counselor. Right. Mm -hmm. But I would say that in almost every survivor's journey, there's going to be a time where they need somebody who is trained and has done the research and has done the experience to work on that particular part of your trauma. Because if it were easy to work past it, you would have already done it. Right. <laughs> right. Nobody would be traumatized if it was easy. Right. Everybody would just, you know, work through it. You know, so that's really important. And, you know, I just have a couple more questions for you. Um, I don't see any any other questions over here or um, in our chat. So um, just a reminder, if anybody has any questions, feel free to um, drop them in the comments here and I'll be sure to read them. Um, but what do you say to those people who really want therapy, but they're afraid to take the first step. They're feeling overwhelmed. You know, what advice do you have for them to help them take that that ever important first step? So trauma gets us stuck. We get stuck in the in the way that it happened, the way that we experienced it, the way that and we don't feel like we survived it. We feel like we're still going through it. But that time is gonna pass either way. You're going to be stuck in this same part of your life emotionally, physically, financially a year from now. 
or you could have a whole different life. And I get a front row seat to seeing the changes in people's lives after a year. Sometimes they'll say to me, I don't even know that person from a year ago. I have compassion for her. I have empathy for her, but I, I don't live there anymore. No forwarding address, you know? So we try to make it really easy because we are on the other side of that table, that desk. And I, I'm not afraid to say I go to therapy every Friday. You know, I need it. Um, (laughs) So we have our, you can schedule a free consultation with us right on our website. You don't have to make that cold call because that's one of mine. I hate cold calls. You don't Mm -hmm. have to, um, to email or walk in or anything like that. They can go straight to our website, traumatherapycompany.com and click schedule and schedule a free consultation with any of our providers and it's all, all our consultations are online in their own home. They can do phone, they can do video, whatever is easier, you know? So we try to break that ice from the beginning so you're not talking to a stranger. We don't have wow. a receptionist, we, I answer the phone. Your mm-hmm. therapist will give you their business number, they will be the one answering the phone. So you're not gonna call and tell a stranger that you know life has happened and you need to reschedule. You're gonna talk to your provider. You know, so we just try to break that ice because we also have been through it, you know? Yeah. Oh, I love that. Uh, that that's really helpful, actually. Um, so, do you have any final thoughts, you know, to share with the listeners? Is there anything that um, that you want to to leave them with this morning? Um, you're licensed in the state of Ohio, right? Okay. So, just make sure everybody knows that that it's uh, for the state of Ohio. Um, but do you have any other final thoughts that you'd like to share? Just that there is hope after healing, that it does get better. I know therapy and support and working through the past is a lot of work, but it is worth it and you deserve it. And at our agency, we genuinely care about our clients. And sometimes that opens us up to being vulnerable, but how can we expect somebody else to be vulnerable if we're not? You know, mm. so we're, we cry with our clients, we cry with our clients, um, mm-hmm. you know, and we know because we know what it feels like and we're genuinely there for our clients. So um, I know it's a stranger that you may be reaching out to, but they won't be a stranger for long. Oh, I love that. You know, and I really think that's a beautiful way to end. So with that, I thank all of you for joining me today for episode 29 of Survivor Strong. Kara, thank you so much for being here. You've really provided a lot of helpful information for our listeners. And who knows, maybe we'll have you back to talk about, um, you know, a a specific topic. Uh, Maybe we can, you know, just do a whole show on EMDR and, you know, and how to get started in that. And, you know, we'll see because it's very very interesting to me. I would love to learn more about it. Um, And remember, everybody, if you would like to be a guest um, right here on Survivor Strong, you can um, just go to my website, www.survivorstrongpodcast.com and complete the be a guest section. Look forward to hearing from all of you. We will be back Friday, May 12th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here live on Fireside, Facebook and YouTube. And remember, everyone, you got this. We're all in this together. Until next time, everyone. Have a wonderful day.